marvelous mushrooms. And I wanted to ask, I know I can't see you or hear you, but I wanted to get your opinion about how you feel about mushrooms, right? Who here has eaten mushrooms? Because this is probably what you think of when you think of mushrooms, right? And you probably also are going, Ugh, like, gross. Honestly, I also am going, Ugh, gross, because I think that these are the most boring mushrooms out there. However, we as humans in a society have figured out how to grow these button mushrooms because they grow on manure and dirt. So we can actually have these really big farms of them and our neighbors in Pennsylvania are actually the mushroom producing capital of the The world. So familiar with, but honestly, they taste the worst, in my opinion. <laughs> now, here's an example of some of the mushrooms that I really like. And then I like putting them on different stuff than just mushrooms in a dish or in a frying pan. Here are some wonderful morel mushrooms. And you can see these are two different types of pizza because I do this every year. These little brown rings are slices of our wonderful West Virginia morel mushrooms. And on pizza, they are absolutely amazing. So let's begin the science part of the lecture and talking about what actually is a mushroom. So a mushroom is not a plant. They are in their whole own group called kingdom fungi. And kingdom fungi are different than plants in a lot of ways, but you guys can learn about that in biology class. We'll just go over a few quick concepts here. Most of a mushroom's existence is spent in a substrate. And a substrate is something like soil, wood or other matter, and they live as microscopic hyphae, which means that we can't see them with our eyeballs. We have to use things like microscopes to see them. And a single strand, like in this picture here, is a hyphae. And if they are in a group, we call them mycelia, right? So it's a lot like the plural form of certain words, like a goose and, a, and geese, right? It's a different word. And the actual mushroom that we see, like what Kevin had on his screen, that's what we call the fruiting bodies of a fungus. And the fruiting body is a lot like an apple is to an apple tree. You can almost imagine this as the roots of a tree. And this is the fruit that we can pluck off and eat or other animals in the forest can use. And if you think about what's inside of an apple, they're seeds, right? And that's the whole point of the apple, to make a whole new tree. And that little seed inside of it is being dispersed by something eating it. Mushrooms are kind of the same, except they produce something called spores. And you can see in this picture here, these little dots that we can't really even see again with our eyes, but we can see with the microscope, those spores will make a whole new fungus that will make its own mushrooms. And not all mushrooms look like these pictures here, but these are usually the kinds of pictures that you'll see in a field guide that will help you learn certain features of a mushroom. And even within this standard mushroom example, there are a lot of components that can be used to help us understand the crazy diversity of kingdom fungi. And this is a picture of all the different types of mushrooms that are out in the forest for most of the summertime. So we have things like our puffballs, these guys that are just little clubs. Here's some little discs that don't have any stem or anything. Then we also have these beautiful big cups in the, growing in the grass. And here's some things that just look like a bad hair day. So they can have different shapes, different widths and lengths can make a certain species different than another one. Things called ornamentation, like this picture here, where there's like these little lacy frills and scales on the cap. And even a mushroom can look really different at different stages of its age. So this mushroom called the Caesar's mushroom, which is in West Virginia, looks like a little egg. And when you cut it open, you can see the baby mushroom inside of it. And that egg will actually hatch and look like this, where the orange cap of the mushroom starts to pop out. 
and it'll keep growing until it can fan out. And then when it fans out as it's older, you can see it actually has this specific little ring, which you couldn't see before. So it looks very different from when it's a week old versus, versus when it just pops out of the ground. And there's also different hymenium types, which is the easiest way for us to learn different types of mushrooms. And I know that's probably a weird word, so we're gonna talk about it. The hymenium is the spore producing surface of a mushroom. So that's where those little apple seeds come from on the fruit of a mushroom, right, of a fungus. So we have gills, which you guys are probably familiar with. It's the most common one shown in those ID books. But there's also things like pores where we don't see gills on the bottom of this mushroom here. We see things that just look like little tiny holes. Then we also have teeth. A lot of mushrooms have teeth or spines. And then there are some mushrooms that have a smooth surface, which is called a smooth false gill. And again, I'm gonna keep telling you this the whole time, most of these pictures, including all of these, were taken in West Virginia. So all of these cool different things here are in West Virginia. And there's also the cup fungi. So the morel, which is super famous around here, does not have gills, it doesn't have teeth, it doesn't have pores, it has little dips that look like little cups or saucers, and that's where the spores come out of. And you can find all of these different types of fungi with different types of spore surfaces all year round. So these were all growing right next to each other. We have a mushroom with teeth, a mushroom with false gills, a mushroom with pores, and then a mushroom over here with very distinct gills. And what's happening on those gills, if we pull open the cap, we can see I ripped open the cap here, and this is one of those gills. Here's another gill, here's another gill. On the surface of all of these gills, we can't see with our eyes, but we can see with a microscope, are spores. So this is a picture looking through the lens of a microscope, and these little dots are growing on the side of these gills. And if we look closer, you can see they are on these little balloons that inflate and when they get big enough, they pop off the spores and the spores will blow in the wind and go somewhere else to start a new fungus. And sometimes they're even in these little tubes, these little sacs, and they'll grow inside of the sac and they'll be shot out so that way they can fly even further. And these spores are super important if you wanna learn how to identify mushrooms because sometimes they are the only thing that's different between two mushrooms that look almost exactly the same, but they can have different things for us if we wanna enjoy eating them. It could be something like this example where this purple mushroom is actually a different species than this purple mushroom. And both of these are in West Virginia. So the Cortinarius is toxic, meaning it'll make you very sick if you eat it. And this is called a bluet, which actually tastes like orange juice. It's very good and it's growing right now in West Virginia. And the only like obvious difference is that their spore colors are different. So one has these rusty brown spores, another one has really bright white spores. And sometimes if you look close at the stem of the purple mushrooms, you can see these little brown dustings here are actually spores that have got caught on the stem. So this one is the brown spored one that'll make you sick. But there's many different types of colors of spores. They can be red, they can be black, they can be brown, green, purple. It is really amazing if you make these spore prints and you can do this with any mushroom. You can put the mushroom cap where the gills are or the pores are and you can put it face down on a piece of paper or you can put it down on aluminum foil to see what the color of the spores are. So if you leave that mushroom cap on the paper or the aluminum foil overnight or for a couple of hours, you can actually see the spores and these beautiful decorative rings from dropping down off of those gills. And the spores, when we look at them with a microscope, can even be really distinct. So if you're a super nerdy scientist, you can look at spores all day and tell the difference of the species. Some of them have, well, a lot of them are these little circular orbs. They're just like little circly dots. Other ones look more like sausages, and they're actually described in textbooks as sausage-shaped. 
Some of them can have really sharp angular edges. So this one looks like a soccer ball close up where it has, you know, how a soccer ball actually has like kind of flat sides, even though it's a circle. And then there's even ones that have little tails. So this one down here has these distinct sections and then it has these little tails on the end. So what happens when those mushroom spores go do whatever, right? They land and everywhere in the forest. They're a lot like pollen. They're landing everywhere on our cars and our nose, everywhere, but they don't all grow into an apple tree, right? So an apple seed needs to be planted in the soil. Where does a mushroom spore need to be in order to grow? Well, a lot of mushrooms eat wood and they have specialized chemicals that allow them to break down wood and eat it. But there's also a lot of really intricate relationships where mushrooms are actually fed sugars by being in a relationship with trees. So if you see a mushroom that's not growing on wood and it looks like it's coming right out of the ground, it's usually in a relationship with tree roots and they share sugar and water because mushrooms are really good at accessing water to help trees survive. And so the tree says, thanks, here's some sugar. But mushrooms can eat a lot of weird stuff too, right? They can also eat other mushrooms. And here, uh, these are all West Virginian again. I literally found this yesterday, look, same nail color. So I still have black nail polish on. I found this at our park. And this is a mushroom called the piggyback mushroom because it eats other mushrooms. So it looks like it's going for a piggyback ride. And then there's even crazier stuff like this that mushrooms eat animals. So this is a spider that I found again two days ago at the park where it has a fungus growing on it. So these are the spider legs and this is a fungus. And then those are the little mushrooms coming out of the spider bug. Pretty creepy. But knowing what a mushroom grows on is really important if you want to know how to eat it. And these are two different species of mushroom in my hand. One of them, again, will make you very sick, but the other one is absolutely delicious and tastes like apricots. So this is a jack-o'-lantern mushroom called Omphalotus eludens, and this is the chanterelle. So the chanterelle and the jack-o'-lantern look really similar, but if you know what they're growing on, you can tell that they're different. A chanterelle is in association with tree roots, meaning that it's sharing water and sugar with the trees. So it'll always be coming out of the ground. So these are chanterelles that are coming directly out of the dirt. And over here is a jack-o'-lantern fungus that is growing on wood. A jack-o'-lantern only grows on wood, so you'll never find one coming right out of the soil. And you can use this to tell the difference between them. And some mushrooms only grow with certain species of trees in these really special relationships where they share water and nutrients and minerals. And this is an example of a really pretty purple mushroom that only grows with, what is it, four species of trees. So this is an example from California, but I was out there and we, we went hunting for this specific mushroom because it's really pretty. And we knew where to go because we could find where Sitka spruce was and if you see, those cones there are of the Sitka spruce. So this mushroom only grows with that tree species. There's another really cool thing in the forest called mycoheterotrophs. And those are plants that actually eat the mushroom. So when you go out in the forest, and if you see a specific species of plant that is a mycoheterotroph, you can come back later in the year during mushroom season and find the mushroom that it's eating. So looking for mushrooms is a really intricate experience. So know your tree and plant species in the forest. So how do we tell the difference between different types of mushrooms? We can look at really distinct features of their caps and other parts. But this is a fun example where, again, these are all from West Virginia. I found these on a simple walk. These were all probably within 20 feet of each other because I put them all on the same log. And all of these different colors were really helpful in trying to figure out who they were. But there were other things in the cap of the mushroom that was helpful, like looking at 
the size of the gills. So here we have two purple mushrooms, but you can actually see that the gills on this one are bigger than the gills on this one. And that actually makes them very different. There's other things like the cap here has a dip. This one has a big dip and some of them are really flat and don't have any pits that can hold water. So sometimes features like that, which are mentioned in field guides can be really helpful for ID. And you'll just learn these things as you get into mushrooms because here's an example of the gills coming down the stipe, right? They're coming down the stalk, but you'll have this other situation where the gills never ever touch the stalk. And then you'll have examples where there's a really big gap and it might, you might think, well, that is really super, you know, pointed to know that, but this is a feature that always happens with every single mushroom of that species. So you'll always see this really big gap or this like attachment directly on the mushroom stalk. There's also things called rings and veil remnants. And this right here is a ring that goes around the stalk of the mushroom. And if a mushroom species has this ring, every single time and that mushroom will have this ring and it can make or break an identification of a species for you. And there's also differences in the stalk or the stipe. So we have the long standard type of mushroom stalk. We have ones that are kind of short and stubby. And then we also have ones where they don't have a stalk at all. And this is a West Virginia mushroom that's really common and also really famous because people use it to make teas and stuff like that. It's very healthy for you, but it is called turkey tail mushroom. And if you think about a turkey body right here, you can kind of think this looks like the big turkey tail feather arrangement, right? It's pretty cool. So there are some examples of mushrooms that have dead giveaway features, meaning that there's only one type of mushroom that looks like this. And if you experience that, then that's what it is. And so it's, you know, being unique has its payoffs for us anyway, that we can identify them. And there are certain types of mushrooms like the jack-o'-lantern mushroom that glows in the dark. Hence why it's named jack-o'-lantern, because it glows at nighttime. <laughs> so you can actually see it uh, glowing like this. I was hiking once and I saw it was nighttime and I could see in the distance that there was a green glowing fungus and this was it. So learning these traits takes time and it's good to just read your field guides like a book if you wanna learn about these things. But here's a few examples. So these are mushrooms that are found in West Virginia that they actually lactate, which means that they produce a waxy, milky substance. And here it is when you damage those gills, this milk will come out of the mushroom. These are areus, which if you know anything about Greek or Latin, you, it can be helpful, but that translates to a web. So these mushrooms will always have a web around their gills. This mushroom is called strawberries and cream or the bleeding tooth fungus. And these types of mushrooms in the Hednellum group will always have these bleeding little oozy droplets. And this is a really cool one. In the Boli group, if you open up the cap, they will turn blue right before your eyes. So this is because of a chemical reaction. So when you open up the mushroom and it's exposed to air, to oxygen, it turns blue. So the chemical will turn bright blue. And this can be interesting to identify mushrooms because some species will turn blue immediately, like right away. But other ones, you open it up and you can slowly watch it turn blue. And that means it's its own different species. So where can you go to find mushrooms? And uh, especially in West Virginia, I will tell you everywhere. So Kevin had that mushroom that he found in the mulch outside. We just put that mulch there two days ago. And I've been spraying it with the hose because we planted some flowers. So the, the moisture of the mulch allowed for these mushrooms to grow. So you can find them everywhere. But mostly you can go into the forest and find mushrooms growing on trees or in a relationship with trees. And I chose this picture here 
because it shows two things that are good for mushroom hunting. One is that it is fall and it's nice. You can assume that it's nice and cool and moist in that forest. And that is when mushroom season really kicks off here in West Virginia. But moisture is super important. It is like a go time key for mushrooms to start popping out the fruit. And so I wanted to share you some examples of easy 2ID edible fungi. And of course, you should always consult textbooks, show someone else, show an adult, do a lot of safety protocols before eating any of these mushrooms. But this is just meant to give you an idea of what to look for if you see these in the forest or on a bike ride or something, especially this time of year. So the number one mushroom that you're gonna find right now that is edible is the chicken of the woods. Its scientific name is Latiparus. And it is an orange mushroom that has pores on the underside. It does not have gills. And those pores are yellow. And this, this can be cut up and it tastes like chicken. Hence why it's called chicken in the woods. You can bread it like chicken nuggets. You can put it in a stir fry. I've made a bunch of different stuff with chicken in the woods and it is delicious. The chanterelles are very common in West Virginia in the late summer. So usually in August, I find a lot of these guys, uh, sometimes into September too, but we have a lot of different chanterelles in West Virginia. And a lot of them taste like apricots and cinnamon. And it's a really good example of when you find a mushroom, you don't have to always use butter and garlic, like what a lot of people say. Uh, the chanterelles actually have a very sweet taste. Like I said, they taste like apricots and cinnamon and they smell very good. And I have made biscuits, ice cream, simple syrup to put in tea. So it makes it the tea taste like apricots. I've also made candy and I've made soup with these chanterelles and they are amazing. The lobster mushroom is popping up right now in West Virginia. And this is a cool mushroom because it is actually two fungi. This is an example of a fungus eating a fungus. So here is the russula that this, this is a species of mushroom that gets attacked by another mushroom that turns it red and makes it taste like lobster. And I just had some two days ago, it's very good. But you can see this looks like the shape of a mushroom, right? It has those gills, but they've been completely covered up by this other fungus on it. The porcinis are kind of rare in West Virginia, and they are very big and meaty. But if you find them, you'll have, a, have to fight the bugs because the bugs really like to eat this mushroom too. But it is possible to find it here in West Virginia. And this is one that is probably growing in a park close to you, growing on grass. So these are the shaggy mane mushrooms, which I do really like in a pan sauteed with butter. They get very crispy and tasty. And I think this is the last one because it is the most famous, but everyone's probably familiar with the West Virginia morels. So morels again are those cup fungi. Their spores are produced in these little cups. And these grow in the early spring and are super delicious and can be used in quiches. They can be put into meatloaf. You can add them to anything and they're very good. But I do wanna warn you again that foraging for mushrooms is a baby step activity. Don't jump into being an expert. If in doubt, throw it out. Don't put it in your body because some mushrooms can make you very ill. And some mushrooms are even deadly. And this is a poster that I saw at a state park that was warning people about the different types of mushrooms that are deadly. But if you learn the deadly mushrooms, you can kind of assume that the other mushrooms aren't deadly, but you need to learn more about them. And you can eventually learn that, you know, you don't have to avoid all things that look like this. There might be something when you become an expert that is actually worthwhile to forage for. And this is just a fun example of how serious you need to be in learning mushrooms to eat them. So these are two different types of mushrooms that grow at the same time of year. They grow in the same forest, they grow with the same trees, and they even grow under the dirt, right? So they pop up under the dirt like this. And they look really similar except for this orangey colored here. Well, this Ammonita ocreata will kill you but this Ammonita velosa tastes like butter popcorn. 
And this is definitely something that only an expert should try to cook with, but it is a good example about how serious it is to know your mushrooms before you eat them. So how I learned mushrooms in West Virginia is by using field guides. And these are four very good field guides for West Virginia. There is one that is incredibly regional, Appalachian Mushrooms by Walt Sturgeon, and it's mostly all West Virginia species. And then we also have Mushrooms of the Northeast in Eastern Canada. And here are two mushroom books for the whole entire US. But you can also use free resources like Facebook, so there is a mushroom ID forum. So you can type in West Virginia Mushroom Club and there are people who will be happy to help you ID things and learn with you. There's also a lot of pages where you can learn all about certain specific types of mushrooms. And there's a lot of people who are super nerdy about it and like to learn with everybody. You can also use other things like YouTube to learn about mushrooms. And we even have a North American Mushroom Association called NAMA where they have club meetings and they go for hikes and looking for mushrooms together. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll see if Kevin has any questions for us in the chat.